encouragement to one another, right? Because Lord knows there are trials and tribulations and hardships and opposition in our lives uh, every day. So that concludes our Bible study uh, portion of our program for this morning. We will uh, now have a closing prayer, and then we will be followed by a five-minute intermission. Those of you that remain in the sanctuary, we will continue with the Lineage series, and the rest of you can take the opportunity to go out and say hello, use the restroom, get a drink, what have you, and then we will reconvene in here for the worship hour. Let's go ahead and bow our heads. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. We thank you for the promise and the hope through Jesus that each of us have. And we thank you for your uh, everlasting love and your guidance and your counsel. And you can provide us direction when we don't know where to go or what to do. Thank you for your watch care over us. In Jesus' name, amen. and numerous educational advantages. At the age of 12, he was appointed to a chaplaincy in a church in his hometown. His head was shaved and he received a tonsure. As he grew up, he wanted to become a priest and was soon noted for his intellectual ability, his blameless life, and his religious devotion. It was confidently anticipated that he would grow up to become a great defender of the Catholic Church. Calvin had heard of the new doctrines with a shudder, not doubting at all that those who believed them, the heretics, were worthy and deserving of the fires to which they were often taken. At the age of 14, a plague hit the town where Calvin was living, and so he moved from his town here to Paris and studied at the University of Paris. An interesting coincidence took place whereby one of his fellow pupils was a boy by the name of Ignatius Loyola. Ignatius Loyola would grow up to found the Jesuits, a movement very, very different from the one that Calvin would lead later in his life. Two pupils, both outstanding but who would both have a vastly different impact on the world. Calvin later on left studying for the priesthood and went to study law after his father's footsteps and after his wishes as well. He completed his doctorate in law at the University of Orleans, but after the death of his father, he would reevaluate his course and direction in life. Calvin's cousin had joined with the reformers, and whilst in public when speaking with him, Calvin would strongly defend the positions of the church and reject new teachings. When he was alone, he would ponder the words. Conviction of sin gripped him. He saw himself without an intercessor. Confession and penance were resorted to in vain, but none could bring about peace. One day he decided to visit a public square and he witnessed the burning of a martyr. He was filled with wonder at the expression of peace that was on his face and he contrasted this with his own feelings of emptiness, doubt and darkness. He knew that the martyrs rested their faith on God's word and so he proposed that he would study the Bible to see if he could find the secret of their joy. As he studied the Bible, he found Jesus Christ. No one knows for sure when Calvin experienced conversion, but that he did is not open to question. His conversion was definite enough to cause him to relinquish all income from church sources and abandon any idea of entering the legal profession. This decision would have been costly, causing him to give up an immense salary and all comforts that he was accustomed to in life. 
Calvin joined a small band of Protestants and preached the gospel from home to home for two years. The authorities were determined to capture him and kill him, and they came to his place of abode. But due to the quick thinking of some of his friends, they detained the officers at the door for long enough to allow others to lower him out of the window, and he was able to flee the city. One thing that we learned from the life of Calvin is that no matter what you start out doing in life, it doesn't have to be that way for the rest of your life. He started out wanting to be a priest, his father wanted him to be a lawyer, he ended up doing neither of these things and would go on to be a great reformer who changed the face of the whole of Christendom. Maybe you're in a course of study that you don't really enjoy or know why you're there. Maybe you're doing something that your parents have imposed upon you and that you don't really feel is your calling. And God may be calling you to something different. And I want to appeal to you that if that is the case, then follow the leading of the Lord. You may have to change your course of study. You may have to change your occupation. But when you do that, that's when true satisfaction, purpose, and meaning comes in our lives.
everybody. Let's raise our voices and sing number 12. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee. Number 12.
Good morning and happy Sabbath. Nice to see everyone here and like to welcome all the regular members and any visitors that happen to be with us. And uh, even though it's rainy outside, it's dry inside and we can praise the Lord for another day in this blessed Sabbath day. Um, there are going to be a few changes. Um, as you notice, Mark Wilcox is, was down to speak, but uh, he got sick, and so Brian Clark will be filling in. And um, I didn't get Micah's name in time, but he will be having the scripture reading this morning. And uh, we have a friendship lunch today, and everyone is invited. And uh, next week, we have a special speaker, uh, Mike Ryan. Uh, all his information is in the bulletin, so read it. And uh, how he was, um, he met up with Dawn. And uh, next week is also Dawn's memorial service. And uh, in here, just make special note that, you know, there is a meal at 5 o'clock but it is for immediate family and uh, outside guests only, unless that has changed. Okay. And so then her service will be at 6.30, and then uh, we are invited to uh, have some desserts after some of Dawn's favorite desserts. And uh, just make sure that you look through your bulletin and uh, a lot of information and things coming up. So let's just uh, make note of them so that we can take part in what uh, the church, as we are in action of trying to reach others and to inspire ourselves to be closer to the Lord. So now we'll continue with our service and we'll have the introit 694, page 694. beautiful Sabbath day and uh, even though it is raining outside Lord we it is raining showers of blessings and we just want to thank you for your great love and grace that you have for each and every one and for bringing us safely here through another week as we know that the devil is working hard to discourage and to lead us astray and that we will always keep our minds on thee and that you'll have a special blessing for each and every one here today and we just thank you for thy great love in thy name amen now if you'll stay remain standing and open your hymnals to page five all hope in god bound.
be seated. Happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading is going to be in 1 John 4.16. And so we know and rely on the love of God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. Now shall we kneel as far as possible in prayer. Sabbath and be with those that are sick and suffering and for those that are having problems Lord and we ask especially that you be with the weeks in their time of need and uh, be with Roby help him to have a good recovery and, and our Lord there are so many others and we just pray that Thou will bless and give them the strength to meet the challenges of whatever it is it has, but that your will will be done in their lives. Lord, we pray for those that are in harm's way, for all the soldiers and police officers, firefighters that go every day and uh, are unsure if they will come home or what and be with their families give them strength keep them keep them in the palm of your hand and we just thank you for those that are willing to do that and we know that this world is waxing old and it's only going to get harder and harder and that's why we need to root ourselves in your word and in you and surrender our lives to thee now we just ask that thou be with Brian as he brings his word, that it will be a blessing to each and every one of us because we know that it comes from your throne. And we are glad that Brian is willing to be a tool that you can use to spread your word and your message and that we all will be willing to do our part. Because Lord, I'm... I'm waiting for the day that you can come and take us home where there will be no more pain, no more suffering. And that we can just be with thee forever. I know it's incomprehensible, Lord, but that is...
what we all long for. And so we just thank you for the grace and the sacrifice that you made to make this all possible. In thy name, amen. children's story so if the children would like to take the baskets and collect it and uh, James Palmery has our story today several reasons maybe it doesn't have enough milk maybe there's twins and it can only take care of one sometimes if they're separated say overnight it doesn't recognize its own its own lamb the next day so it'll actually reject it and say I don't, I don't want to take care of this so it's kind of a sad story and you know sometimes things like that happen to us we feel rejected we feel sad um, but you know what happens to this lamb is the shepherd actually takes the lamb into his house he feeds it talks to it keeps it warm in his own house and then when it's strong enough the shepherd will take it out and put it in the field with the rest of the sheep and so when the shepherd goes to check on his sheep, he'll call to them. And guess who's the first ones to come? The little sheep that he took care of and fed and spent all that time with. They'll run to him. They're happy to see him. It's like, it's like seeing his mother or father. But I have a question, though. Do you think 
that the shepherd loves the little bummer lambs more than he loves the other lambs? What do you think? No, no, he takes care of all of them the same, right? The difference is those little bummer lambs have actually experienced that love. They know exactly how much the shepherd loves them. There's a verse in Psalm 27.10. It says, When my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Did you know Jesus is our shepherd and he takes care of us? He takes care of us in the good times and the bad times. And he wants to spend extra time with us. You know, he's made food for us to eat, but he's also given us the Bible. And you know, a lot of people don't realize this, but when you read the Bible, that's Jesus actually talking to you. So John 10, 27 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And so the more time we spend with Jesus, reading what he has to say, or listening to it when someone reads it to us, the better we're going to know him and appreciate the love that he has for us. And then when he comes to call us, we're going to be excited to see him too. So let's, let's make sure that we spend a lot of time studying his word so we get to know him really well. All right, you can go sit down. member teaching team. In addition to academic development, these students are building friendship with fellow students, being mentored by their teachers, and growing in their knowledge of the Bible as they experience the love of Jesus each day. Your prayers and ongoing support of the combined youth ministry funds will help ensure our elementary schools along with Sunnydale Academy and our summer camp programs remain vibrant centers of ministry to our young people. Please consider a monthly gift. It's an investment that pays heavenly dividends. Would the ushers please come forward. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for all thy many blessings and thank you for everything you have done. And now it's time for us to give back to you because all we have belongs to you anyway. And you only ask back for a percentage. And so help us to give freely so that we know the time is running short and our young people need your guidance and your leading because this world is just waiting to devour them. And we just pray, Lord, that we can continue to move forward until thou comes. In thy name, amen.
actually I was out of town got a call this week and asked if I would uh, fill in for special music so until I got home last night I had to try to find a song the song that I've chosen today is one that has seen me through good times, bad times, and uh, it just, it's um, a song that without the Lord in our lives, we're not going to make it. And today is what's important. Not yesterday, not tomorrow, but today. Today is what is important that we live for Jesus today. To share with you that I've learned about the Lord. He gives his grace one day at a time. He knows what today has in store. Every morning when you rise, just lift up your eyes and thank him for life today. Yesterday's cloud up my mind And tomorrow stands in my way Lord, please help me Help me live today There was a time when worry filled my mind about things I couldn't change. But God is big enough to take care of this stuff, and I live today for His name. Every morning when I rise, I lift up my eyes and thank Him for life today. Lord, help me live today and know what living is all about. Lord, help me live today and give me faith to not doubt. And when the yesterdays cloud up my mind and tomorrow stands in my way, Lord, help me live today and know what living is all about. Lord, help me live today and give me faith to not doubt. And when the yesterdays cloud up my mind and tomorrow stands in my way. Lord, please help me. Help me live today. Lord, please help me. Help me live today. Lord, please help me. Help me live today.
Thank you, Brian. Give me our prayer. Micah, thank you for reading our verse this morning. Appreciate that. It's always a blessing to hear someone read God's Word. I send you greetings from Mark Wilcox and also his apologies. Uh, he got sick and he was trying to tough it out, but it just was too much for him yesterday. So I look forward to hearing his sermon on Noah whenever he's able to deliver that to us. And uh, I hope that as we study the word today that uh, you will still receive a blessing. Let's go ahead and bow our heads and ask for the Lord to guide us in his word. Father in heaven, Lord, we are just so thankful for the gift of prayer. It gives us hope. It gives us an opportunity to bear our souls before you and confess our sins and to plead with you, not only for the behalf of ourselves, but those around us. Lord, you already know every situation, every heart, every concern, every desire of our heart. Lord, thank you for loving us so much and having the wisdom to answer the prayers in a way that is favorable to our salvation and those desires that we have that we so clearly think would be in accordance with your will but are to our detriment or to someone we know to say no. We invite your Holy Spirit now as we open your word. We claim that promise that wherever two or more are gathered and we open your word, you will be present and that you will guide us into all truth. May this truth this morning speak to our hearts. And it's in Jesus' name we say, amen. The title of our study this morning is Love. And that seems a little cliche, but I've really felt impressed lately that if I ever had an opportunity to speak again, that I wanted to talk on this. I don't know that I'm the ultimate authority or totally qualified to do so, but I believe that God, through His Word, speaks to us a lot about the topic, and that's what I want to share with you this morning. I found the Lord when I was 10 years old, accepted Him as my Savior, was baptized into the Adventist Church. I've never regretted that decision. I have faltered on it at times, unfortunately, my fault, not His. But I believe that if we're not careful, we can fall into the same trap that the Pharisees, priests, and rulers did at Christ's coming. My brother has a saying, he has a lot of sayings, I find myself quoting him, I've had the blessing of having a wiser, older brother. Doesn't mean we didn't have our differences at times, but uh, I love him dearly and he's a good man. Um, it goes like this, it says, proud, but not prideful. And I think that we can be proud of the fact that we embrace the beliefs that we recognize that the Adventist Church have brought from the Bible. Fundamental beliefs, our understanding of the sanctuary is unique to us, and other principles. But I think if we're not careful, we can find ourselves taking a wrong pride in Adventism. Is being an Adventist going to save us? No, it's not. Are there others who are not Seventh-day Adventists who are going to be saved? Does God tell us that in His Word? Yes, He does. And so we need to remember that. We need to use that as a guide. So what does save us? Does being a Christian save us? Kind of a loaded question, isn't it, Paul? Just a little bit. I'm not intending it for it to be. Just take it at face value. What is a Christian? It's someone that wants to pattern their life after Christ. They believe in Christ as their Savior who has paid the price that we could not pay so that we can live as He deserves, right? That's being a Christian. I've heard the term used before, good Adventist, sometimes in jest, sometimes in seriousness. And if any of you have used that phrase, I'm not here to condemn you this morning. But I want us to be mindful of the fact that the priests, Pharisees of Christ's day, when He came, they were offended that the shepherds and that the Magi from a foreign land 
came to seek the Christ child, even though they had had the scriptures in front of them. They knew the prophecies forward and backwards, but they were so caught up in tradition that they had lost sight of the promise and what the Messiah was really going to look like. And I feel like we can be in danger of that today. As Brian Toy said in his sermon, often when I prepare for a sermon, most times I feel like I'm more blessed than you are. Hopefully you are blessed today because of God's Word, not necessarily because of me personally. But it's something that the Lord speaks to us when we spend time in His Word. And I would encourage you to spend some time in the Bible daily. If you know someone that would like to offer to study with you, study with them. Or if someone asks you to study, or if they don't, offer to study with them. It's a real blessing to get together and open up God's Word. And so we're going to do that this morning. Now, I always love to refer to the references that I'm going to make and the statements I'm going to make from the Bible. And I sometimes get a little bit over... Uh, uh, I think I've got more time than I do, and I have more scriptural references, and I know it takes time to look them up. But uh, if we'd start off in John, and I want us to go to chapter 13. And so we're going to, as we look at this, we're going to say, okay, so if being an Adventist doesn't save me, being a Christian does, what are the attributes of a Christian, and what does that look like, and do we have any guidance and counsel on that? Because we don't want to take false pride in our traditions or false hope in our traditions or our beliefs. Because after all, we are saved by grace, right? By the grace of God. And so as we turn to John chapter 13, and I should have been doing that while I was talking. I'm going to be reading to you from the uh, King James Version. John chapter 13, verse 34 and 35. I have a red letter edition, which I kind of like because it helps remind me of who's speaking. Who's speaking here, if anyone else has one? Jesus is, right? So I always kind of want to pay, pay special attention to what Jesus says, but in reality, everything that's in this book is what Jesus has said, that he has used through the Holy Spirit moving upon men to write his words. And the Bible says, beginning in verse 34, as Jesus is speaking to his disciples, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another, as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Then he goes on to say in verse 35, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love one to another. A lot of things have been done throughout history around the world in the name of the Lord and under the guise of Christianity. And a lot of them do not represent love in any form or fashion. So I would ask you this morning, the question that I ask myself is, what I'm doing, does that represent love? Am I following the commandment that Christ gave as disciples of Him? Am I showing love? I grew up thinking that music was a, a very important part of my life, and unfortunately I listened to a lot of the wrong kind of music. But during my childhood as I grew up, there was a song called All You Need Is Love. I think of another song, I think, I won't name the author, I'm not sure, but it's uh, What the World Needs Now Is Love. Sweet love, right? Is that true? It is. So what separates the love that we have from the love that some of the other groups that we know that are in the world today that are good people who are out working with the homeless, feeding the hungry, clothing them, and claiming they have no need of God, but yet they're good people. Are they good people? Nobody wants to answer that, do you? That's, that's a tough question, isn't it? Only God knows their heart and their motive. We do not. I think that falls under the category of love. It's not our job to judge, right? If someone's out doing something good for someone else, I believe that that initiated from Christ. They may not recognize it as that in their life, but this book tells me that all good things come from God. So if somebody's out doing something good for someone else, they may not recognize it, they may not acknowledge it, but I believe that spark for them to do that came from God. And so we need to remind ourselves that we can't judge the motives of some of these other groups. 
But we need to be as conscientious about our fellow man and helping them and showing unconditional love as they do. Isn't that one of the beautiful things about a pet? How many of you in here have pets? Maybe some of you aren't pet people. Cat, dog, ferret, hamster, whatever. But isn't that the neatest thing that when you come in the door to have your dog greet you or your cat or something? I mean, it's just, they don't look at you and say, eh, I don't like that sweater you have on or, you know, or, or your hair, you're having a bad hair day, so no thanks. They're always happy to see you. They give in unconditional love. We can learn a lesson from our pets. So as I was preparing this study, and I just felt like the Lord was really placing this on my heart, I started wanting to know what was it that Christ, in, what was his view on love, and what kind of love did he demonstrate? And he tells us here, right, right here in John, he's telling his disciples, I'm only with you for a little while, I'm going to give you this commandment because I'm going to be leaving, and that is you need to love one another. Now these guys were with Jesus every day, so you'd think if there was ever a good, loving, kind group, it was them. But how many instances and accounts do we have in the Bible where they were fighting amongst themselves the whole time? As a matter of fact, Jesus would be out walking ahead sometimes, and they'd be 30 yards behind because they didn't want him to hear what they were bar uh, bickering with each other about, which was usually who was going to be the greatest in the new kingdom. Pride, one of the original sins, one of the first sins, has caused many a man and woman to fall and lose sight of their dependence on God. That's why Jesus said we need to love one another. The world has perverted the word love. We live in a world of confusion. There is all kinds of confusion out there. What food is good? What is health food? What is gender? I, I, I'm, I don't even, I lost count of the track of how many genders they're saying are now. And, and there's gender confusion in the world. Um, there's confusion about who God is. Satan is the author of confusion, folks. If you haven't figured that out yet, he's the guy. Because the more confused he can keep us, the more he can deceive us. Let's turn to Micah 6 8. Micah 6 8. Micah, a minor prophet. Sometimes kind of hard to find some of these books in the Bible. Most of you probably know this one by heart. Um, somebody here, I'm trying to remember who it was right off, used to have that as their signature in their email. Micah 6 8. And learn. I usually mark all these before I do this, but I didn't do it last night. And I'm demonstrating how true it is to find the book of Micah sometimes for me. I know it's after Jonah, which is another one. Joel's a hard book for me to hide. It's right before Nahum. I know that. There it is. Okay. Nahum. God bless you, Nahum. I found you. All right. It's going to be good when I get there. <laughs> All right. Like a six or say. I should have just quoted it. He hath showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require of thee? Isn't that a question that we often ask ourselves? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. Thank you, Keith. Yeah, we know that verse, right? Easier recited than lived, though, isn't it? For me. Justly, mercy, humility. Justice is actually even kind of a skewed perspective. It seems like every movie or story starts out with some horrific wrong, and then the justice comes where the person comes back and kills everybody in the movie that was had anything to do with anything, and that's what everybody feels is justice. 
Most people don't want mercy. They want mercy for themselves, but they want what they think is justice for everyone else. I'm so thankful for God and His mercy for me because if it were not for grace and for His mercy, I would not have a prayer. And so that humbles me in the presence of God. So these are some of the characteristics of love. Romans chapter 13, 9. I'm going to use a lot of New Testament verses today, but I also want you to know that Romans 13, 9 is basically a repeat of Leviticus 19, 18. And many of the verses that I read today that are from the New Testament are also found in the Old Testament. So I don't want anyone leaving here saying, well, yeah, love came when Jesus came because the Old Testament when God and the Father were running things was uh, more of an arbitrary and vengeful and fierce uh, type of situation. Not true at all, and we'll get to more of that in a moment, but I just wanted to mention that. So Romans chapter 13, verse 9. And the Bible says... For this thou shalt not... Wait a second. Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. So basically we're getting to repeat of the Ten Commandments here, right? So these are God's commandments. Now he just gave us a commandment that we love one another. Is love in, in all of the commandments that God gives us? It is. It is. These aren't fighting with each other. They're actually enhancing one another, that they originate in love. If we love, we're not going to commit adultery. If we love, we're not going to kill. If we love, we're not going to steal. We're not going to lie. We're not going to bear false witness. We're not going to covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, and then here comes the punchline, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. We all know that. We've heard that. Love your neighbor as yourself. Do any of you have neighbors that are un unlovely? That are hard to love? Do you have co-workers that sometimes you'd like to wring their neck? Maybe I bear my soul from the pulpit too often, but this is trying. And it's impossible without God's help. But it is an attribute of Christ. And if we are going to claim to be a Christian... We need to be able to ask God for the power to be able to love that person. After all, we're unlovely, we're sinful, we're broken, we're undeserving, but God loves us. So if we're going to receive His love, we have to be willing to share that love with others, do we not? 1 John chapter 4, let's define love, because I think confusion of love in the world. Often love is equated to sex and material goods and, and other things. But let's look at a definition, a true definition of what love is. 1 John 4, and again, most of you can probably recite this, 1 John 4, 7 and 8, and we're also going to read verse 10. First John 4, verse 7 begins with, Beloved, let us love one another. So were there some problems in the early church? Was there probably some disputes going on? Envy, jealousy, I'm right, you're wrong. Do we have differences of opinion on certain things that are in the Bible today? But should that cause us to lose sight of the fact that we need to come together and agree that God is love and we're saved by His grace? And that if we continue to study together in His Word, He will not let it return void and He will lead us to truth. Let us love one another. Where does love come from? What's that next verse say? Love is of God. That's where love originates. It's from God. God the Father. And everyone that loveth is born of God and knows God. He that loveth not... God, for God is love. He that loveth not, knoweth not God. Ooh. Hmm. Really? He that loveth not, knoweth not God. That's what it says. For God is love. 
So if we claim to know God, and He's our Savior, and we want to follow Him, we want to emulate His character, we want our filthy, righteous, unrighteous righteousness to be covered with His, we have to have love. Where does love originate from? From God. We just established that. So isn't it good to know the source? And isn't it good to know the source is ready and willing to give that love to us if we ask for it? And also to give that love for others? And then verse 10. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us. We have this tendency to puff ourselves up and think that we're really doing something great because we do this. But it's not because we love God, but that because God loved us. And out of that love that God the Father had, the plan of salvation that was prepared before the foundation of the world, He sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. That is the greatest demonstration of love that has ever been given. Do you ever think about that at times? Do you ever wonder, why did God bother with us? He, he, is, he is so majestic and omnipotent and just could have spoke it all away and started over again. But to go through this whole process, the plan of salvation is blows my mind. But it's the greatest attribute and proof of His love. It's not dictated, it's not commanded, it's not created, it's demonstrated. He is bound by his own character, which is love. And I like to know that I serve a God that never changes, that he is always going to be that loving God. As a matter of fact, when the sin problem is eradicated, it will be out of an act of love that that happens. And if it weren't for this entire process, there may always be a question. What happened to that Lucifer guy? Of course, then that begs the question, why did Lucifer sin? Why did God allow him to sin? Freedom of choice has had a much higher price than we can ever imagine. But love by freedom of choice is the only true love that there is. It is the greatest freedom that there is. Satan lies to us and would make us to believe that we are handcuffed, that we are um, not of our free will, that this is being forced on us, when really sin is what we're a slave to. He's the taskmaster. God is a God to set us free, and He does that through His love. And He's demonstrated that through the plan of salvation with His Son, Jesus. John 3.16, going to help us define love. Do we need to turn to that? For God so loved the world, right? So in case there's any doubt, this book often repeats God's love. I like the way the Bible is written because it not only repeats, but it moves in and magnifies and amplifies the message. John 3.16, that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. For who? For just a select group of people? For whomsoever, right? Are we those people? Are we whosoever? I hope so. I hope that we claim that promise, and I hope that we believe. And if we believe in Him, we should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then verse 17 often doesn't get read in conjunction, but I think it's important. And it says, verse 17, For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. You see, Jesus reconnected us with God. When sin occurred in the garden, it broke the bond between God and mankind. It would never be the same. When Jesus came to reestablish that bond, He reconnected us with God. And it is written that we already know God loves us. We can't, we just can't grasp the depth of that love, even though we talk about it, we have analogies for it, we read it in His Word. It's almost incomprehensible because it's such a pure, the width, the depth, the height of God's love is more than our minds can comprehend. But the fact that 
he loves his own son more because of his sacrifice for us this really points me to John chapter 17 do you ever just turn to John chapter 17 and read Jesus prayer you should it's moving and Jesus talks about I am you and they are in me and we are one that's what we have under the umbrella of love we have the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as our Savior not because God doesn't love us, but because God loved us so much that he sent his son to be able to reconnect that relationship with him. And as a result of that, any of you that are parents here, if someone does something nice for your child, do you not appreciate that? You actually almost appreciate that more than if someone just does something for you. This is really kind of what God has given us the family unit for, is so we have a glimpse of what the Trinity, the Holy God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in group effort, work in our behalf. And that love includes us. And it, it, is, it is phenomenal when you think about it. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. This always comes up. I, th I think that it's, it's, a, it's a promise that we need to continue to claim repeatedly because we do have the sin problem, do we not? What does Romans chapter 5, verse 8 tell us about God's love? But God commendeth his love, verse 8, are you there? By verse 8, but God commendeth his love towards us in that once we become perfect, isn't that what your version says? No? Oh, while we were yet sinners, he commendeth his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So he doesn't expect us to be perfect to come to him. His appeal is come as you are. As a matter of fact, he sent his son to die for some before they even knew who he was. That's what the whole sacrificial system was set up for. People in the Old Testament of the Bible were looking forward in faith to what that sacrifice was going to be. People of the New Testament after his death and us included in that are looking back and claiming that sacrifice. But that was done for the atonement of sin for anyone who would accept it. Do I hear an amen? Praise God. John chapter 14. You know, it's, I don't think it's any coincidence that a lot of my verses are found in the book of John. Because John is referred to the disciple who loved Christ most, right? I think that's kind of interesting. John chapter 14, verse 15. Next time I'll mark my Bible. I always like to hear the pages turning, though. <laughs> All right. 14, verse 15. This is a red letter verse again. And verse 15 says, If you love me, keep my commandments. Now, we just read some of the commandments. But we also read the commandment to the disciples. And what was that commandment? Love one another. Right? So can we keep the Ten Commandments without keeping the commandment to love one another? Not at all. Not at all. And who can give us the power to do that? Only God. And then let's just turn back one chapter to John 13, 34 and read that again, just because it's right there. It's actually just right above it in my Bible. And it says that new commandment that I give you is that you love one another. And then did Jesus give us an example for everything? He did. And he says, as I have loved you. So he's not asking us to do anything that he wouldn't do himself, is he? And then this is the verse that weighs the heaviest on my heart because I struggle with being able to have love for everyone. I'm going to be honest with you. I have a tough time with that. I'm not a real people person. Um, people annoy me. They frustrate me. They disappoint me. But God is showing that, you know what, I do that to other people as well. So you think I'd be a little more forgiving with that, wouldn't you? 
and he's trying to teach me that. So as I look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 20, this is a very sobering verse for me. Many of you, no doubt, know what it is already. Verse 19, if we love him because he first loved us. And then verse 20, if a man says that I love God and he hates his brother, he's a liar. Wow, that's really strong words. If you say that you love God and yet you hate your brother, you're a liar. For he that loveth not his brother, whom he hasn't seen, who he has seen, excuse me, how can he love God that he hasn't seen? Very practical question, isn't it? How can you claim to love God that, honestly, you can't prove exists? Other than your own personal experience and faith in His Word. But someone that you can see, feel, touch, you can't get along with. That is not demonstrating the true character of Christ. We need to pray that He can help us to love one another. To see others as God sees us. Someone that's on a journey in a troubled place in a foreign land that wants to get to our eternal home. And we need to do all that we can to help one another to get there. It is not our job to judge. Sin is the same in the eyes of God. Your sin is no worse than mine. Mine is no horrific than yours. We tend to categorize sin, don't we? That's a dangerous thing. In closing, let's turn to the book of Corinthians, chapter 13. As everyone knows, Corinthians chapter 13 is the love chapter, right? Very good principles there. <clears throat> First Corinthians chapter 13. And it goes through it. It lists all these things that we can do that others might, or even ourselves, might consider to be the acts of a good person. But it tells us if we don't have love, that it's of no value. Let's read, let's begin reading at verse, uh, in chapter 13, let's read verse 12 and 13, which is at the end of the chapter. And it's gone through and told us all these things about what real love is. And it says in verse 12, the Bible says, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. When we meet Jesus, we'll see real love. We'll see true love. Now I know in part, but then I shall know even as I also am known. And in verse 13, now abides faith, hope, and charity, which that word charity is often substituted with the word love. These three, but of the greatest of these, is love. And that was my message this morning. I hope that uh, the Lord would encourage you to be loving, be kind. Be faithful and true, and to pray for the strength to do so, because I'll guarantee you somebody's going to test you. Might even be me. But uh, I appreciate all of you, and I just hope that uh, we can walk in the way that the Lord would have us to. I changed the closing song this morning to number 579. Thank you, George and Jay, for making that change. Number 579.
for your love towards us and for your ability to create in us that love to share with others. Lord, I pray that we will empty ourselves of our own prideful spirit and that we will accept your spirit of love and that we will not judge others, but we will see them as a soul that can be saved by grace as we are through Christ Jesus. May we leave this place, be loving and kind, because the doctrines that we have, no one cares to hear if we're not a loving, kind person to start with. Lord, thank you for seeing not what we are, but what we can be through you and for offering forgiveness through your son's atonement for our sins. And it's through his name we claim these promises today. Amen.